And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables, virtual or every, otherwise. Yes, every week we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. And this week we got all three, really, because the big thing that happened was the Extra Life 24-hour Charity Gaming Marathon, a worldwide event that raises money for the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Now, as mentioned earlier in the show tonight, usually this is a huge deal for us. Like, honestly, in Windsor, it's the biggest public gaming event of the year. Um, Almost like a small gaming convention. But that wasn't meant to be in 2020 due to the global pandemic. With shifting timelines for what is allowed, where, and when, and constant concerns for the health of everyone involved, another casualty of 2020. Yeah, we didn't, it, 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 it did take some damage, that's for sure, but we did keep it alive. So what we did is we encouraged other gamers uh, and ourselves to hold their own Extra Life 24-hour gaming event. Um, we had one of our own for the three of us, the entire Bellhop team, that had a mix of both physical and online gaming. And we encouraged other people to game in their own homes or take part in uh, appropriately safe fashions. Even if we couldn't take over a store and game together as one, we could still get our game on for charity. Yeah, so what we ended up doing is we went with just 24 hours straight, starting at 11 a.m. on Saturday, going to 11 a.m. on Sunday. That was going to be the 24-hour window of gaming. Um We started off 11 a.m. on Saturday. We live streamed the whole thing, got the stream up and running, um, I think on time even for that one. And started off with a special Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion actual play. So what happened was Deanna and I rescheduled our Friday night game for Saturday morning. Just uh, we weren't going to do both. And played through scenario number 19, which was the um, Den of, excuse me, Den of Thieves. This was an interesting one. Um, Once getting things set up. We had uh, a lot more room than usual on the stream, which was interesting. So positioning things took a little lot longer because it was only a two pager and featured lots and lots of vermlings. And it was our first, um, it it was close. It it was our first time to have a a character get exhausted partway through. Um, It wasn't looking good uh, for most of the game. I think Deanna had called it uh, about halfway through. Didn't think we were going to get through that one. Um, I got to learn just how well the Void Warden can tank, which is not very well, but well enough. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, what was interesting is this was our first side quest. So this is this was our first... We didn't progress the main plot at all. This was, hey, go here and keep dealing with the Blood Cultists or check out these, uh, I want to say Skaven, Vermlings off to the side. And we decided to check out the Vermlings off to the side. And that was definitely interesting. And I, I'm wondering if, if similar to Gloomhaven, if the side quests are actually ramped up in difficulty to the base, the base game. It was uh, definitely interesting to watch. Uh, I had basically sort of given up on on you guys winning. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I was shocked when I kept realizing you guys are still going. Oh, yeah. I thought this was over. I thought you I thought it, it was done. I thought you and no, no, you're, you're still plugging through and slogging through, you know, uh, vermling bodies piled up around you yes uh, <laughs> yeah the last for whom were those monstrous rats or, or something rats i think it was monstrous rats and i don't know how many waves of rats i managed i managed to get myself into a nice corner where only two of them could get to me and there were two of the weaker not the elite ones and it was just a matter of living through their attacks and how my, my, our our luck was garbage that entire game oh. like we should have won that like six turns earlier like it's just if you throw up any card but this, nope. There's that card. Card, card pull. The first card pull oh. of the game was off, and it yep. went downhill from there. Oh, it was terrible. Like, like it's like no matter what, if I do at least one damage, we're gonna win this. I only have two cards in my entire deck where that won't happen. Oh, there's the miss. Like it was that bad, and yeah. it just kept happening. And I, I was gonna be so frustrated if we had lost through that, but it worked out. I, I was shocked. I didn't think we were gonna get through that one. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait to get this one on um, on YouTube due to the fact that I don't know what's going on. Like, I think it's because we had the camera run too long. So the files are bigger or there's more files. But our way to transfer files isn't working. And I've been trying for two days now to get Sean the um, the video here so we can splice it and edit it because we're using that. Uh, the second camera does weird things where it cuts out every five 
gigs or show. I don't know what it is. Time it's a time. Right? It's a time thing. So it runs for a certain amount of time, and then uh, you know basically saves the file and starts again quickly. Yeah. So we were able to get the files. I was able to get them three out of five so far. After the show is done tonight, I'll try to get him another one, but I think I might have to wait till tomorrow, which also means I'm not going to be able to get you the audio for this right away. Uh, I could uh, that I should be able to do. Yeah, that one. Eye. That one should work in Google. So yeah, I should be able to use Google to get that one. So if anyone knows free software for transferring large files, we would love the uh, suggestion because what we were using somehow, some reason, this week stopped. And yeah, it I, I think like it I think the next I think our next best option is going to be that TerraShare. Um, but yeah, I don't even know what's up with that. I, I can't have it. It won't find the files on my PC to send them. Right. So, yeah. I don't know. We'll have to, I, again, yeah. there's something weird about this whole thing this time. So we'll just, hopefully yeah. it's, it's, we'll, we'll write it off and start again fresh next yeah. week. And it, it just, uh, this week again. Been, and, uh, this week's <laughs> been a mess. So while that was going on, on the physical table over at the bellhops house, I started in the purely digital realm with some Minecraft. Um, as a treat and to myself and perhaps to some viewers, I was playing a snapshot beta version that's only been out a week or two, but contains a huge wealth of new content for the Minecraft game that isn't going to be in full release until next summer. I decided I'd start a, a new world for extra life and I started right from scratch and just got to mining and crafting. Yeah, I didn't check that out. We were too busy playing Gloom, so I didn't get to see any of that. What What are the new features in this beta that people might want to check out? Uh, so they have added uh, a bunch of new blocks. There's actually now uh, Amethyst is now a thing within the game. Uh, and also, really uh, interestingly, Copper is now a new ore. Okay. Uh, and on top of everything else, Copper actually ages. So it actually mm. oxidizes over time <laughs> within the game. Uh, and fun things like you can use your copper and your amethyst to create, to craft a spyglass, uh, and, and, you know, okay. look off, look off into the distance a little easier without using, uh, mods and stuff like that. And there's a bunch of little things. Uh, I know I was talking with Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton the other day, and he's really excited about the fact that, uh, path blocks can now be made out of both dirt and grass and podzol and mycelium, not just from normal grass the way they are currently. Uh, which is a, a, a huge feature to those people who, who understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you went off into the, the, the part of Minecraft where I'm like, no, nope, now I have no clue what he's talking about. Copper oxidizing, that makes sense. Yep. New things to make, spyglasses, that all made sense. But <laughs> half blocks, nope, no clue. <laughs> all right, after we finished Gloomhaven, which did go way longer than we thought because, wow, that was tough. And, and the, it just kept bragging because we thought it was going to be over one way or another. Um, we started a little later than we wanted, but we got the kids to come over and we broke out a brand new game to us. Well, new to us game, and that is Harry Potter House Cup Competition. Uh, first off, I do have to say thanks to the kids for our pa their patience because, man, did we have a lot of technical issues. Like we had tested the stream the night before and it was, I would say, fragile at best, but I got it to work. But it was not working at this time. Now, the laptop we use is not designed to handle two camera inputs and the mic. It ends up all three of those together, pushes it beyond its USB limits. Now, we did manage to get it to work, but uh, the, even once it was working, we were still having problems with cameras freezing pretty much randomly, as far as I can tell it. First, we thought it was a connection issue, but then it would just happen in the middle of us playing. So I don't know. Yeah, sadly, adding the lights to the setup was much more cost effective than a new computer. We're still yeah. working on that tonight, though, is it was and this weekend was about the charity and giving to hospitals, not working on our stuff. Yeah, we could definitely still use the uh, we're, we're still working on the new PC angle. But yeah, I don't think we're going to be trying the two camera thing again. So uh, for those of you who watch our Gloomhaven streams, it's not coming anytime soon. I do apologize. Hopefully before the end of the year, but definitely not in the next couple of weeks, because, man, that was a mess. Like it, it, it was frustrating. It didn't make sense. Stuff would work and then cut out and I'd switch scenes and all of a sudden something would be gone. Uh, it, it was extremely frustrating. And like I said, thanks to the kids for putting up with that. Now, as for Harry Potter House Cup competition, uh, this is one I think people are going to be very excited about for fans of Harry Potter. This is a very light yet solid worker placement game. And the more I played, the more it kept reminding me of Lords of Waterdeep. And there are so many people that push Lords of Waterdeep as the gateway worker placement game. And I think this may even replaced it for that. 
Though I do have to say the theme is even more pasted on than in Lords of Waterdeep, if not at the same level. I would say even less. It, it's even more pasted on. Like, you don't even get artwork, or at least Lords of Waterdeep, you get a picture of a dragon or a beholder or something. You don't even get that here. Everything's sing symbols. So this is a game... It's worker placement where you have three workers, you have your three students, each of the players is one of the four different houses, and you are going to take your students and send them to various places at Hogwarts, the library or classes or uh, the apothecary, I can't even remember all the spots on the board. In addition, there are random buildings that are put out to get added to the game, and that's another part that reminds me of Waterdeep, but instead of being built by the players, they're just randomized at the start of the game. You're going to go around and collect knowledge and magic, you're going to complete lessons to get some bonuses, all with the goal of finishing challenges. And the challenges come in two levels, easy and hard challenges. Each round, your goal is to try to complete two, if you can. Like, that seemed to be the thing. And at the beginning, you're going to be stuck to probably trying to complete little easy challenges, moving on to the harder ones. Eventually, you can only do one of each. The kids really liked it. I, I thought it was way deeper than I thought it would be. Like, I read it and went, oh, it's a gateway worker placement. You're collecting stuff to finish stuff. You're collecting these resources, then trading them in to get points, basically. But it was there was way more pre-planning required than I thought. And another big aspect of this that actually feels more D&D-like than Waterdeep is you level up your characters as you're playing. When you send your characters to classes, they get better at um, charms, potions, and defense of the dark arts being your three main classes. I thought it was solid. Uh, the kids seemed to really like it. But man, it took a long time. Like The box says 75 minutes, and I think we were well over two hours by the time we were done. And that, combined with the delay of getting things going, did have my youngest a bit bored. But you know what? She stuck with it to the end. Yeah, and I have to say, the theme is very curiously pasted on. Uh, Potterheads, myself included, having watched it, uh, will get frustrated at some of the things the game enabled because they're using named characters from the movies. Uh, okay. I feel like the game would have been stronger in the Potterverse theme if they had avoided official characters, right? If they hadn't mm -hmm. used Harry and Hermione and Draco and, you know, these characters that everyone knew and just gone with either, you know, named characters, but not primary characters right. or something, but kept the Hogwarts school theme. I mean, the, the classes and, and the, the, the school works. But having, you know, having these, you know, having Harry doing, doing this, this, this stuff that everyone immediately assumes is a Slytherin thing or having the Slytherins, you know, achieve all this wonderful, fantastic stuff <laughs> that should be reserved for, you know, the, the protagonists um, grinds the wrong way a little bit. And I mean, yeah, fine. It's a game. And, and, you know, it's, it's great when Slytherin all of a sudden achieves things, but it would have been better to have Slytherin achieve it without the uh, thought of that evil Draco mm. being the one to do it. Yeah, another thing the kids pointed out, and Deanna's pointed out in the chat too, was timeline issues. That they had events from all seven years of the story kind of happening at once and overlapping each other. Yeah. Uh, her biggest complaint was Ced Cedric Diggory having tea with Doris Umbridge, which that I don't get that reference myself. So I will say, for one thing, if you don't know Potter, or, or vaguely no Potter, because I, I, I know of it. I played some of the video games and I, I did watch the movies. Um, I think most of them, if not all of them, it didn't matter. Like it, it really didn't matter what you were doing. Though the kids did get a kick out of it. They're like, they were really upset that, that, um, that Slytherin formed uh, Dumbledore's army. That was the one that broke my kids. Yep. And I'm like, I don't know. It was worth 60 points. I got to admit, it does have probably the coolest scoring mechanism I've ever seen in a game. Not mechanic, not mechanism. Scoring physicality, the, the way yep. you do it, which is a bunch of plastic test tubes that you actually put in gems. And you put in these little plastic gems and they fill up the test tubes to see what level each house is at. And I actually really love that mechanically because you couldn't quite tell where anyone was at. So like it, it, you get the advantage of kind of seeing if someone's gaining a lead, but you never know if you're quite ahead of them or not. So it doesn't quite have that chase the leader problem, but still gives you some information on who's like, you know, a little G's not doing so well. I'm not going to pick on her. I'm going to pick on big G who seems to be doing really well. And oh, look, her mom seems to be past her. It's time to start aiming that way and I, I was really impressed by that it looks cool and it's thematic that's that's the one part yeah and it's, it's actually kind of it is theme. actually not the same as but similar in a similar vein to the way that the the hogwarts actually keeps score for the house cup yeah. uh whereas they it's 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 a little more um uh, uh hourglass ish in the in okay. the in the movies but 
still, it's a similar concept of, you know, piling up these little things to, to see who's winning. And so they, they really did go on theme with that. Yeah, I did like that one quite a bit. So overall, I, I got to admit, I was impressed. The kids seem impressed. We're going to give this one a few more tries, and then we'll be doing an official review of this one. Um, thanks, the op, for sending us a review copy. Probably should have said that at the top here. Um, actually, quite a few of the games we mentioned now, maybe, eh, maybe. No, most of what we are playing tonight isn't actually review copies, but that was. So I should have said that from the top. But yeah, I got to say, it, it captured the feel, and I think – for fans of the series, this is a great like this. This was a great way for my kids to learn what a worker placement game was. I really think it is. It's, I, it's the first they played, and now they get the whole send your student to do a thing and get something for it, and then trade in a bunch of that stuff to get something else. Right? That that's a pretty tried and true mechanic nowadays. Yeah. Uh, despite the fact only being invented in my lifetime since Kalis came out, it feels like it's been around longer. But like now, my kids have familiarity with that, and I, I got to say, like if you like D and D, go with this. If you like Harry Potter, go with this because the, they're definitely a, a great introduction to that mechanic. Uh, up next, we played a three-player game of Chronicles of Crime 1400. Uh, Deanna's mom came over to join us for this one. She had played the first case with us. Uh, this time we were playing the second crime out of four, which, uh, got to say, proved to be much harder than the first one. And, well, the tutorial, obviously. Uh, this had some neat new stuff. Again, I'm, I'm seeing the functionality and had a bonus of using an app with a video game or with a board game, sorry, with a board game and what that can add to the game. And the one thing it did was I didn't realize it was doing this, but it makes sense it's doing this as it was keeping track of what items you had shown to each character and reacting accordingly. So, for example, I don't want to spoil anything here, but at one point we were told to keep something a secret. Then we went somewhere else and talked about that thing. And that ended up really pissing off the person who told us to keep it a secret and actually put a big roadblock in our investigation. Like that was a big mistake that we made by doing that. And I kind of suggested at the table and I'm like, I don't know. Um, so that, that was interesting to see it work. Now, Deanna does want us to point out at the time that there was a bit of ambiguity how one particular item in this worked. Now, again, I don't want to spoil anything, but there is, in this game, we've talked about it before, so I don't want to give a full overview, but you're going to get clue cards, and the clue cards are generic. So it'll say, like, notes and letters, or it'll say melee weapon, and it can represent different things. Well, in this particular case, one item, one card, seemed to be representing two different pieces of information, and we were having a hard time getting the app to realize which part of the information we were talking about, or we were not understanding which part of the information the app was going to pick, because it's not like you got an option. So we're like, we're going to talk to this person about this thing, and you're like, no, 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 it's talking to them about this other thing, and we get punished for it. So that that was my first complaint about the Chronicles of Climb series. Now, I don't know if this is something that carries over from the original games, but this definitely was um, where we got the frustration of using an app because this is something, what exactly does something represent, right? Like we know as players sitting down playing this game, that if we were this character, we would go interview this person about this and then getting to figure out how to do that in the app was harder than it should be. We're like, well, we want to talk to them about this. Do we scan this card or this card? Which, so there, there's, it, it's not the shining example I found in the first two. I wasn't like, oh my God, the app's awesome. Now I'm like, okay, I can see a few of the, the, the problems with the system. Yeah, there seemed as a viewer to be a lot of frustration with the system more than the mystery itself. Uh, because yeah. of the way the game is set up, doing something that is simple, um, like, you know, I want to, you know, I'm, if, I'm at a, if I'm at a place and I want to do this one thing, it's not always immediately obvious how to do that. Whereas you yes. know exactly what it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. I want to do this because I think it's involved in the case. There's no way to just immediately say, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so there's some frustration and I don't know whether it's uh, familiarity with the system or I, uh, you know, just the way, the way people were referring to things and, and just, where that difficulty is, but there was mm. definitely some system based uh, struggles yes. in that particular play. Yeah, it's so hard to talk about without talking about what <laughs> no, actually happened. I know. I'm like, this thing we want to do. You know exactly, what, I, you know exactly oh, yeah, what I'm yeah. talking about. <laughs> exactly. 
And then like, there's just other stuff, right? You're like, I want to ask this person about this location, but you can't ask about locations. You can only ask about items yeah. or you have a dog. That's not a spoiler. You have a dog with you. Well, the dog, you want to talk to the dog about the person, but you can't because the dog only actually interacts with items. And then a bit that this one actually is frustrating and dumb, in my opinion, is if you ac activate the dog and then scare, scan a location or a person, it costs you time. That shouldn't happen. Like if the mechanics of the game is it can only scan items, it should just tell me the dog only scans items. Don't punish me right. for scanning the wrong thing. Like just a, hey, remember, we did pretty poorly overall. Um, part of it, I think, being due to the spoiling that one thing earlier, another not realizing how to make certain things interact we ended up getting 40 out of 100 points and did not honestly in my opinion solve the main case now the points what we did get were basically for a side plot like something that happened in the middle of the story we were able to figure out who did what and why but we didn't get the, the the core clues the the main story and what's interesting about this especially compared to what i've said about the game previously on the podcast or on our uh, or even on the blog is that we're going to replay this and it's going to be interesting because I, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work out. Because I had always thought, you know what, once you solved it, why would you play it again? But you know what, we only solved part. And when we finished it, we had the option. I could have read the solution and found out why and how and what we missed. Like we do know one particular item we missed out on that we know we need to get that item to solve it. I would have figured, no, you're done. We failed. No, we're going to go back. So we're going to actually try the game again. So part of it, yeah, we're going to be able to skip through quickly because we know the results. But uh, like, for example, that one secret, we'll keep the secret next time and see how that plays out. So yeah. there's actually a level of replayability to this game that I didn't realize was there on previous plays. Yeah, it's handy that you can take another run at it and avoid certain pitfalls that you know are there and perhaps make the right moves. <laughs> Though I can see that it is not so easy that knowing what you know now a second run is still a guaranteed success. No, I don't think it is. I don't like, we'll know that one side plot and what happened there, but that's it. Uh, Deanna's pointing out an amusing aspect is it's Chronicles of Crime Tragedy Looper Edition. And that's exactly it. Hey, the character you play is prescient. So yep. there, there is that. So there you go. We're even sticking with the theme. Yep. So yeah, there is definitely something to be said for replaying a case to try to get a perfect score without hitting the solution. So we're, we're going to do that. So it's, it's cool to see that the game has more replayability than I thought. So at this point, it had actually gotten surprisingly late. Like uh, I realized it's only three games, but those games took a long time. Um, all of them took significantly longer than we thought. It was, it was nighttime by this point. So we got some Windsor style pizza from Capri. And while waiting for that to show up, we're like, you know what? We, I don't want to sit downstairs. Let's, let's move things upstairs to, to here on the PC into the office. And we started playing some games on Board Game Arena. Now it ends up, we stayed online for the rest of the event, which I got to admit, one of the big reasons being that, you know, my game room is pretty comfortable. It's now very well lit and the chairs are comfortable, you think, for one or two games. But after about 12 hours, those chairs aren't so comfortable anymore and things start going numb or sore. Um, as Deanna pointed it out, you don't realize how much it hurts until you get up to do something else. And then you're like, "Ooh, I can barely walk. <laughs> so yeah, once we got upstairs to the comfy office chairs, it was a little hard to leave those. Yeah, I didn't have Windsor Pizza, not that I'm bitter, but I do have a very <laughs> nice chair. So there you go. I'm good. You had the chair. So the first thing we did is all three of us finished up a game. So we had a game at Clans of Caledonia going from before I Extra Life finished out that game. Um, that went fairly well. That was a closer game than I thought. Uh, both Yana and I had some good try. I think you had your best I showing ever I, too. Yeah, and I, 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 was, I ended up being kingmaker on that one uh, mm. because you would have taken it if I hadn't uh yeah. if i hadn't, if you hadn't out. cut me off if you hadn't cut me in half <laughs> divided my territories in two so that my provinces or i can never remember what they're called in that game yeah. what, what my my colonies couldn't hook up so i i lost out on those points i thought i had that one deanna had a money making thing going there that i've never even seen before she had so much money yeah that was that was insane that was she, was, she was she was in the three digit coins there that was just wrong yeah that was crazy still loving clans of caledonia uh, yep. the, really digging that game loving trying out the uh the different clans and stuff like that um deanna was playing the ones who could make sell their milk for for good money and made 117 coins in the last round where i think i was making like 38 that was that was my first time playing the uh that race race sorry i'm used to the terra mystica 
that clan with uh you get extra money when you buy and sell and well i came in second so i guess it worked well enough but i found them a little hard to play not as hard as the fishermen the fishermen are the one one clan in that game i can't figure out yeah i should uh i should figure that out uh so next we sat down we're like we got to try to find something new to play something the three of us can play that'll be exciting for people to watch because we were live streaming this sean was streaming it on his channel we were streaming it here at tabletop Elha or twitch.tv slash tabletop Elha. um so we decided to try out the crew uh this came up a lot so a week ago we were talking about best trick taking games and everyone was like the crew are you going to talk about the crew jeff in our chat room was like i was waiting till the end you didn't mention the crew what's going on and yes we threw it in our own bunches because we hadn't played the game and i gotta say people were right now that i played it i'll admit we only played on bga this totally belonged in the main list it, it, it should have been a top 11 list or whatever we should have had this in there the crew is fantastic this is a i don't know how many people have played to be honest we were playing three players. Uh, I'm going to guess like one say, to five, but I don't I wanna know. Say, I want to say three to six or something like that. It's, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Sean will probably look it up while yeah. we're doing it. So this is a trick-taking game where there's what? Three different suits plus the rockets. This shows how much we played the game. We got multiple suits yeah. and rockets that go. Uh, the rockets only go one to four, and they're always trump. So the same suits always trump every time you play. And then the other ones go from one to eight or nine. Maybe it's one to nine. I think one it's one to nine. nine. It was one to nine. Uh, one to nine and one to, one to nine four and one rockets. to four. And, and I four, think there's three four colors, colors. Four, four colors, colors plus the rockets, and it plays two to five players. Two to five. Okay. So what this is a cooperative trick taking game where you're not allowed to talk much where you're trying to beat the mission and there's 50 missions in the box. And we started at mission one and I think we played to mission six or so. And the first one is just one person has to get a certain card. So it'll say like the blue two, which is a pretty easy one. Someone has to get the blue two and then every card's in play every game. So you can do your card counting here and you're going to look at it. And the person with the blue two is, is, has got to win that suit or you have to make sure a certain person gets it. And you're going to play a trick taking him to make sure they get it. So it's a, it's a matter of, you know, you throw the blue two and then someone throws the blue eight and the, the person who wants it throws the blue eight and then the other person throws in a blue two or three or whatever to make sure the two goes to them. And then as you go on, it'll be a specific number. And then it might be, you need to get each get a different number. And then the next time it might be you have to get this number before this number. And then one of them was really neat because the captain got to pick who was sick. And then the sick crew member couldn't take any suits, any tricks whatsoever. That was one of the more interesting ones. And I got to say, I really liked that on Board Game Arena for a couple things. For one, you could see which cards people had played. So it did the card counting for you, which I totally missed, but was over in the description. Plus, it was just really well implemented. The way it explained how to do things, the iconography was really good. Um, there's a whole system for that I don't think we use to its full effect for sending information to your teammates. Yeah. Uh, which was something to do with you tap the card and then by your next turn, you would tell someone, I don't have this suit. This is the lowest card I have in the suit or this is the highest card I have in the suit. Yeah, there's a communication phase that is sort of like um, a reverse Hanabi where you can say certain information about a card in your hand, but limited. There is no table talk allowed, which yeah. actually made for an interesting Twitch stream. Uh, well, we had yeah. to find things to talk about that wasn't the game um, or at least wasn't directly related to our hands. Mm -hmm. um so that was that was actually kind of and that was actually part of the fun of it was uh you know having conversations while playing but not talking about your hands yeah uh, made yep. for an interesting uh aspect now the two complaints i would have about the crew is i i still play games better with physical physicality in my hands i don't know what it is same way i i can't win only tom online i i lost at hive later like I don't know what it is. I need to touch stuff, I think, to play games. So you definitely lose out on that, that holding the cards. But the other thing is, is I would not, now that we're doing it and it's off, I don't want to play this not real time. Yeah. Because we technically still have that game going and it's so hard to remember who was trying to get what and what card. Like, yes, I know all the list of what cards were there is on the right hand side, but I think this has to play real time. Like I, I want to, I, even on BGA, like, this is, I, I think what we should do is uh, we'll get together with John this weekend maybe and play some of the crew. I think that might be what we could do. Yeah. Spend a few hours trying to hammer through some of that because that would be another one for us to chit-chat and listen to the 80s music while playing the game at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's definitely a real time. I mean, you know, I can, I can see, you know, holding the cards or not is one thing, but 
playing this spread out with your turn oh, spread out over days is just going to be painful. You need yeah. to actually be yeah. in the flow. Like that's the flow is part of the game. Uh, there's so a yeah. really good reason why this is the number three family game on BGG right now. Oh, it's, it's, it's really good. This is now, now it's on my, Hey, anyone listening who buys me Christmas presents, <laughs> this is one I think I want to physically own. I think this would be a great one for breaking out. And I think you play it like you don't need the same players. Like there's 50 missions. I think you just take whatever your copy is and whoever you play with, you slowly go through them, right? Like if I show up to, to, to the local game store three months from now, it's like, all right, I'm up to number 37. Who's ready to go? Now I'm going to guess they're probably pretty difficult at that point, but yeah, it's there's probably, I mean, you probably need to have played some of the early ones to understand yeah. the flow, but you know, Hey, have you ever never played before? Okay. Let's play missions one to three real quickly. And then yeah, we'll hop just to over get you and, the idea and play. But I think that's what I do. I would have my own campaign version played with groups of different people. Yep. So I admit, once we hit to about number six or five, I just started making bad moves. <laughs> like just dumb. You were, like, you were struggling. You need with that. the suit. I'll play the nine. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I I admit I had like an hour and a half sleep the night before Extra Life, which is just a really dumb idea. It wasn't planned. I think I was just nervous about extra life or streaming. So I needed a bit a bit of a break. So I took a short nap. Now Deanna stayed up. And you and Deanna, Sean and Deanna, continue to play games on Board Game Arena, which I think you started off with one of the ones you taught me in the past. Absolutely. So Jaipur is a great two-player game. Uh, and again, it, it is a trick-taking game of, of sorts. Um, sorry, you know, in a, in a manner of speed. And I'm not a great teacher of games, especially after 13 hours <laughs> of online playing or so. But the game itself and on top of that, BGA's implementation of it are really conducive to just picking it up and going. Um, I think she trounced me three games to one or something. So she obviously got the hang of it. Um, and uh, right now she is talking about uh, having, you know, getting a physical copy of it. And while I agree, I want a new version of it. And apparently there is talk of a deluxe version coming out, uh, but the the cardboard tokens on this are just wrong. It needs clays. Yes. It it needs poker chips or clays or something better than the cardboard tokens. It deserves more. Um, and apparently the art that is in the app version may be coming out in the new mm. new release coming. That's uh, it was supposed to be a twenty twenty, but well, it's twenty twenty. So yeah. who knows. <laughs> Yeah, this is one that happens to be part of the Amazon sale we were talking about earlier. And when I saw the price point on this game, I'm like, that seems awfully high. Like at first, Sean was the same thing. He's like, well, it's not high because you get your poker chips. And I'm like, no, it's just cardboard tokens. Like for a bunch of cards, yeah. it seemed a little too high uh, a price point for what you get. Now, yep. again, if I'm going to go with the number of times we're going to play the game and the quality of the game, sure, it's probably justified. But just for what uh, a bunch of playing cards and cardboard chips. Yeah, now they're solid the cardboard chips. Price. I mean, you can see in the images they are a good thick um, cardboard token, but it's still just a cardboard token. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I found the price point a bit off on that. One. Yep. No, absolutely. But uh, moving on from that, after uh, we we played a few games of that, we were we were both burning out as well. I mean, you'd you'd gone for a, a little lay down, and but we weren't uh, we were feeling it as well. So we wanted something light and two-player friendly that wasn't real brain burning. Uh, so we jumped in to King Domino. Um, you know, nice, light Domino land. Uh, and aside from me forgetting one thing in our first game that that, that cost me uh, the game, even if it, I hadn't been playing against D and going to get trounced anyway, uh, it was just a nice, fun couple of light plays. It, again, the implementation on, uh, on BGA is solid. Mm -hmm. uh, I they possibly could have found a better way to do rotation of dominoes. But other than that, I mean, that's a pretty minor complaint. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's, that's about the only thing I could think of them changing on the BGA uh, implementation of it. All right. After my way too short nap, um, I got up, plugged back into board game arena. Deanna tapped out for the night. Uh, Sean and I spent some time talking about what to play. We did take turns on our, our existing games choose what we talk about the show all the time we always have a bunch of games going one of those existing games that popped up for me was seven wonders and i'm like wait a minute sean's never played seven wonders duel i'm like all right how about we sit down i'll teach you seven wonders duel it's a two player only game 
I love Seven Wonders Duel, especially when compared to Seven Wonders. Like it's it's a solid two player game, but like I honestly I'm not a huge fan of Seven Wonders, but I really like Duel. I think it's better than the original. I would rather play Seven Wonders Duel over Seven Wonders anytime, but of course it doesn't work with seven people. So I do get the appeal of Seven Wonders. Now this was your first time playing Seven Wonders Duel. What'd you think? Uh, I loved it. It's far superior to Seven Wonders. Yeah. You know, I play Seven Wonders on BGA because we can. It's just, it's there. You can, it's really easy to play turn-based with, you mm-hmm. know, not worrying about uh, real time. And so that's why I play Seven Wonders. But to say that I like Seven Wonders would be a bit of a stretch. It's just <laughs> kind of a fine game. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not a okay. great game. Whereas Seven Wonders Duel, I really enjoyed. And I, you know, got, I, I uh, you know, got caught out, uh, on that second game, not paying attention yeah. and, and not understanding how many things I should be paying attention of, but Duel <laughs> is definitely a superior game. Yeah, that was where I won with a military victory. Yeah. So it's one of those, if you're not paying attention, the first game, he let me collect too many, uh, uh, what do you call them? Whatever victory point cards, the blue yeah. cards. And then the second game, I snuck in on the military win. So yep. I just, the way you draft cards, the way it works, the way you get money for your cards, it's just, oh, it's such a smoother yep. system. Absolutely. Even the, the drafting, this the eight wonders at the beginning of the game is well done and knowing when to convert them over, just the decision points are better. I, I still, and, and I got to say, that was my first time playing on Board Game Arena. It worked fantastic. Like I would actually say better than in person in a way because there's too much to track right. in the original game, especially how many yellow cards you have so that when you're going to sell a card, how much you get, yep. you get two plus, like it does all that math, right? Plus if you mouse over, the green cards, the, the the green chips, the things you you get for having technologies, it tells you what they all do. Which every time I play the physical version, it's grab the rule book, look <laughs> up what that stupid green thing does, yep. and then someone uses the wonder where they get to pull green things out of the box. And you got to look those up. It was so much less fiddly. So I, I think this is going to become a new favorite of mine on Board Game Arena. Absolutely. So once we finished off uh, Seven Wonders, I'm like, all right, I taught you one of my favorite games. How about you teach me one of yours? And you ended up showing me Rallyman GT, which I know you play all the time on uh, Board Game Arena. Yeah, and I've been playing four to six player matches of this on BGA for quite a while. And while it's not best at two player, it's a really good way to get a feel for the mechanics uh, because sometimes... Uh, you can get some really longer, long games or long turn breaks in the four to six mm-hmm. players just because there's all there's, there's a lot to think about sometimes. Yeah, for me, it was I, I was surprised by it. It just wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Now, I don't know exactly what I thought it was going to be, but it was definitely different than what I thought it was going to be. I think I expected more of a Euro, like a, a more of a mechanical, crunchy game, something more like Thunder Road, which is a, a fantastic NASCAR based game from GMT Games. And it, this was way lighter, like, like really light. Like th- this reminded me of maybe a little higher than the easy mode in Formula D where you don't do wear and everything, but like, and, and, and Thunder Road kind of in the middle there, but definitely more on the Formula D side. Um, well, being at least similar, right? Cause it was still, it's still dice driven. It's still, it's a very different dice driven. And it was really neat to see how it was done differently. This is actually closer of all things to Monza which is a kid's game we've talked about before. Where Monza, you roll a bunch of dice and then you place the dice out onto the map in different squares that match the colors on the dice and then go forward that many squares. This is kind of that, except the difference is you're going to roll, it doesn't matter the color of the dice, but you're going to roll the dice to see if you were, roll what caution symbols, whatever they represent. And if you roll too many caution symbols, you spin out. So it's, it's more of a push your luck game. I'm like, I, I was pretty cool. I liked it. It was neat. Um, the big thing, though, like Sean said, with two players, it was kind of eh. Like, I, like I got to see the game. Yeah. Now I want to try it with more. Like, I, I want to play this with four or six players. Plus, again, the physicality. It's dice. I want to roll them. This is one I'd love to try in person. So, see, again, once things clear up, if anyone Windsor's got this game, I'll totally play this. And see, I prefer it digitally, so I don't have to worry about all the fiddly dice and bits. But, yeah. again, that's just that's just me. I'm lazy. I like I like computers taking care of uh, the bits for me. And I got <laughs> and I got to talk to Eric uh, when, when we're getting close to the end of our next one. I'll give yeah, Eric a poke so that when we start it up, uh, we'll we'll get you in there. Um, it's just a solid game. And one of the really interesting things about it is the random 
uh, track layout. So mm-hmm. we actually got one of the hardest tracks yeah, rough. I've ever driven on for our little two player training game. Uh, and that, I don't it think was, we got up the sixth gear. No, it was ever. it was it was crazy. Um, but again, it was it was it was helpful in that it could teach you that there are some pretty nasty turns in there that is going to oh, burn yeah. that are going to burn you. All right. At this point, after Rally Man, not that Rally Man was was difficult or anything, but just it's the it was I don't even know what time it was to be honest. It was early, and my brains were melting a bit. We decided to go for something lighter and quicker. Um, I booted up Hive. Uh, this is still one of my all-time favorite two-player games. We played a few rounds of that. Now, that one I think you had played with me in person before, probably years ago. Yeah, it was uh, a, the first It was the first time I played digitally, but yeah, very many years ago, we played it on the table down in the ear basement. Yeah. Uh, long ago enough, I needed a refresher. Yeah, it, it's solid. I, I still like it. Like, overall, Hive's a great game. It, and BGA's version was pretty good. Uh, it, just were, don't switch to the 3D mode. You were highly amused by the fact that what the the bugs always turn towards the queens. Yes, <laughs> yes, I did like that. I forgot about that. Yeah, all the bugs, no matter where the bee was, would all look at it. So it was really good for figuring out where the opponent's bee was. I'm like, my tiles don't do that. So yes, you're right. I had totally forgotten about that. That was a nice shot. So if if you want to play Hive, BGA does do a great job of Hive. Yeah, I think it worked really well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, for some reason we discovered this, and I. Somehow, I don't think we've ever actually noticed the button for it. There is a go to 3D mode button in BGA, uh, which apparently needs to have games specifically designed for it. Because every time we've clicked it so far, all it's done is taken the flat screen and turned it yeah. to be everything flat on a flat screen, but at a, an isometric angle. Um, maybe there are some games where they have implemented this. Uh, you know, some of the newer games, I wonder if Santorini or something has got a 3D version um but so far nothing we've tried it on has i figure if anything it was going to work on it would have been hive and it didn't work on hive so at this point i i know i wanted a break from bga i think you wanted one too i just like i i can't stare and read words anymore i don't know and i suggested booting up star wars the old republic now, yes, I mean the old, now free-to-play MMORPG. Um, we actually have a semi-regular Thursday night game with Sean Hamilton and Sean from Hamilton, Indiana, uh, where we've been slowly playing through the individual class storylines. I play a trooper, Deanna's a De- Jedi counselor, Sean Hamilton's a Jedi guardian, and Sean is, of course, our friendly local scoundrel who he makes just... sure we get paid for all <laughs> of our cases. <laughs> someone's someone's got to demand the huts pay up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is a game I used to play. I used to actually have a lifetime subscription back in the day. We I paid for it for months, got a lifetime subscription, then it went free to play, and I got mad because I was wasting my lifetime subscription and instead got whatever, a monthly stipend of cartel coins or something. Anyway, we got back to this. We were just looking for some way to kill times and be able to hang out more often. So uh, we started playing. And one of the things they added to the game since it was first released and when I used to play it is something called the Conquest System. And while playing this time around, um, I got further than I ever had in the past, I got to this point where I'm at level 11 crafting and I kept needing items that you can only get through conquest. I'm like, that's it. One Thursday when we were one, one of the Sean's wasn't free, Deanna and I sat down and I brought up the, one of the star Wars Wikipedias and I'm like, all right, what the hell are conquest points? How the heck do I get them? What do I do? And we figured out exactly how they work. And a, big part of what we ended up doing on extra life is i taught sean all about conquest points and what to do and basically all conquest points are is you get this bonus currency for doing things in the game right and pretty much all the things in the game like the killing things crafting and so on now to that there are weekly events where you get you you want to do things on certain planets for to, to earn conquest points. And if you get the 50,000 conquest points before the end of the week, you get a bunch of stuff for doing it. So that's what it is. I showed Sean the different conquest points and we traveled all over the galaxy and we went to far too many planets and killed 75 things on each planet and made sure to harvest some nodes. And I don't know, there was a bunch of stuff we did to, to get Sean conquest points. And to be fair, this is also, uh, you need to be part of a group uh, an official group in the game for this. It's not something you don't get the conquest points on your own, correct? No, you do. You oh, still you do. do, but you won't get the group rewards. Right. So, so you can earn conquest points on your own. So, personal conquest points. If you get fifty thousand conquest points in a week, you get a small reward. If you're part of a guild, 
It's actually part of the invasion system where your guild's going to pick one of the three highlighted planets to choose to invade. And if you get conquest points on that planet, it goes to the guild's total. And then if the guild gets to, I don't remember what, 50 million or something, by the end of the week, you get a guild reward. So I it's, it's, it's only five, it's on five million to do it. It's the, the, the 50 million is if you actually want to try and actually invade and win. But yeah, that's, that has to do with the guild thing. So yeah, we, so we both, we were, we were, I was in a guild and I got Sean in the guild and we went out and did it. So we did that. That took a while. It was fun enough. We just walked around and I got to say, it's nice having our um, companions heal us for a change. <laughs> I, I got to sit back and just shoot stuff, which was yeah. fun. So once we both hit the weekly conquest point, we both hit our 50,000. We were looking for something else to do. And we decided to check out their, I, I would call it their Thanksgiving event. I don't know, feast day or something. I yeah. can't remember what it was called. Yeah, it's feast day. Feast day. So yeah, they're having some kind of Star Wars feast day, which I guess is something new in 2020. This is a, a brand new event they ended. They added to the game this year. And I'm not sure if it's going to replace um, Life Fest or whatever it's called. But the No, there's fest. still, there's no way they're going to skip Life Day. Ever, I yeah. mean, Life Day is a major part of the Star Wars um, canon yes. now. <laughs> a, a part some people want erased. Well, yes, yes, there is that. But uh whether or not you, you want to erase it, it's there. You yes. locked it in. So what I was expecting was to go off, do a couple of silly little quests, do something, you know, quick, some quick and easy runs to grab some something and be done. What well, what we got was so much more than that. Wow. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was crazy. Uh, I mean, our first shock was our, our first quest actually turned into a mini game playing as a droid doing work you weren't even playing as yourself you ended up taking over uh, a droid doing working as a droid in the kitchen or in the server or serving for this feast um and that was interesting it was almost a game of tapper um you know in yeah a slightly more yeah, or, or burger time yep yep something like that reminds me of uh yeah, yeah we in a slightly that. more graphically friendly way yes Though graphically frustrating at times too, trying to figure out how to interact with things yes, was there not some easy. Problems with it. It wasn't. Yeah, wasn't a hundred percent done. But yeah. after that, we ended up catching a quest linked up to this uh, this event, uh, and I think we both thought that we were going to go off to a, you know, fly off to a planet, do something, come back, have mm. a cute little story, and be done. It wasn't that at all. <laughs> no. Uh, oh, it was like insane, right? Like there was the first quest that was just like find ingredients on Hoth, right? So yep. we went to Hoth and we went to an area I'd never seen before that was way too high a level for the two of us. It was world so, boss. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we were yeah. at the world boss. Yeah. So we found the ice crystals they wanted from Hoth and we brought those back and then they wanted the whisker off the world boss. I'm like, oh, no, that's like 16 players coordinated. Get your guild to do it. So like, yeah. okay, we're not going to do that. But then there's these two huts. And you can start talking to these huts who are both trying to put on this festival. And then they just started sending us all over the guy dang galaxy. Like it was insane. Like, I don't know how many quests did we do? Uh, I like seem to 20s? recall about eight, eight different planets that yeah. we, that we've each visited in order to go on uh, through all of this. And I mean, oh, it, it and it was crazy. funny. And not only that, um, it wasn't a linear quest because we actually no. separated and while yep. we were going to the same places, we were doing different things in different yes. places on those yeah. on those uh, planets. So there's these two huts, right? And one wants one one's actually like um, um, uh, beneficial. That's not the word. They're uh, both doing good. They're things. both scumbags, but one of them's trying to be nice, yeah. and one of them one of, one trying, of them's to, make trying money. to be nice. The other one's not at all. One's just trying to make money, and the other one's trying to just get their name well known. And you pick one of the two, and it got funny because like you go to one planet, and Sean was there trying to kill rare monsters to bring back meat for the feast. Meanwhile, I was trying to find you know, recipes that had been lost in time that were famous recipes. Now we were on the same planets, but I had to go to different spots to find these. And in the end, we each did the different plot and finished it off. And what was funny is for the like I don't know three to five hours worth of work or whatever it took us. All we got was a title. Like, that was it. Like, at the end, yeah, I got the title, the Magnemonious, because of my my hut. You got the, I forget, the Avarice or something yeah, from yeah. your hut. <laughs> I'm like, that was it? Yeah. And, of course, like, lots of bonus points. So, like, this is the other thing they do for all these festivals is the Abundant. That's right. Deanna got it right. So, Sean can now be titled the Abundant. And I, I'm the Magnemonious. 
which actually I think I set that on. And then you earn all these festival points and there's a festival vendor where you can buy all kinds of stuff that actually doesn't help the game at all, but is mostly um, aesthetic, right? You can get new speeder bikes and you can get outfits and stuff. It was totally worth it because I have the best hat ever. So <laughs> if nothing else, I earned an awesome hat. Absolutely. So after a whole bunch of uh, Star Wars, Sean was feeling it. I was feeling it. We were nearing the end. We're like, all right, what are we going to do for like 45 minutes? So we just got to make it 45 more minutes and we're done. And what I think is really ironic is I was just scrolling through the games on Board Game Arena going, this is the point in time where we need something silly. We need like, we need a party game, like something that, that just kind of re-energizes us. And I scrolled through and I noticed they had concept. And what I think is hilarious about this is I don't know, like at least four different extra life events I've been to now. We ended off the first morning with concept. That was the last game I played before I cracked after 24 hours only to return to the game store six hours later to help clean up. But like, like four times in a row. And sure enough, we finished off with concept and Sean had never played concept despite me mentioning it in almost innumerable times on the show for there was a big joke in 2018 with our podcast that every game recommendation episode we brought up concept and i think there's a good reason for that so this was your first time ever playing it what'd you think so the implementation of concept on bga is really solid so yeah. despite the fact that i've never actually played it and just knew the rough concept of the game we were off and running in no time. I mean, there was yeah. no learning curve here. You, we just started. No, playing. not really. I mean, it was, you know, we were off and running and having as great a time as you can after 24 hours <laughs> yeah. of consciousness. Now, I got to admit, it, it's not the best two player, but it worked. It strongly warned us. It's like, don't play this two player. I'm like, yeah, it worked. We just took turns. You, yeah. you give a clue. I try to guess. I give a clue. You try to guess. And we actually now, had, we had think... some people in the chat room even who were uh, yeah. sort of, you know, joking along and having fun. They were taking the people who had gone to bed like reasonable people yeah. who came on to see if we were still up. So, yeah. So, yeah, we finished off with concept. And that would be all the games we played at Extra Life this year in 2020. Despite not being able to get together in person, I think that's a significant number of games. I think we did pretty good. That's a good mix. We got some heavy stuff. Some Well, not too heavy. We never really got that heavy. Draws of the Lions. Clans. Probably about Clans and Jaws. Clans, Clans of Caledonia was a little heavier. But most mostly games. Mix stuff online and digital, which I think was kind of cool. I, I thought it was pretty fun. 